Welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer, and today we are going to be uh, doing something, trying a little something different here. Uh, Michael Wan and Howdy McCoskey are with me, and Michael is going to tell you all what we're going to be doing here. Take it away, Michael. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Uh, we're doing a little bit of an experiment. I would even say that it's a, it's a, a live wire act of what we've been calling playing the glass speed game. But we're adding a little bit of structure. So uh, the three of us, we all kind of have like an interest. We like to dive in deep and we have different perspectives. And I think that that there's a real value in, in each of our, really anyone's type of research, particularly if they come about it in a very unique way. So recognizing that, and the three of us, we've all been in, in conversation before. We've, we've done shows before. And so we have an understanding of a dynamic. We have a, a, a sympathy going on. So what we decided to do we decided to go and put a little bit of structure around this. And uh, we, we said that we will pick a certain time in the future, like uh, once we're making this discussion. And on that date, uh, I took a screenshot on just a very mainstream, publicly accessible website. And, and I did the Drudge Report. And uh, based upon what the headline is or whatever, whatever is kind of like the most, the, the most uh, um, obvious story, we're going to go and do research on that. Each one of us is going to go and take that and run with that based upon their own intuition, their own sort of like interest. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back here, and this is what we're doing today, is we're each presenting that information. And so uh, we're going to take turns where each of us is going to go and starting with the same point, we're all starting with the same point, we're going to go and do whatever type of analysis we want to do and kind of compare and contrast and see like how, you know, we don't know what we're going to find, we don't know what the other person's going to say. So this is, to me, very, very exciting. I love this sort of stuff. And I've been giddy all day waiting to do this. Um, and I'm going to go, well, let me take one more step back. So the, the picture was taken. We we're recording this one on Thursday, the 16th is today, the 16th, 18th. no, it's 18th, 18th. I knew it was even, um, uh, on Howdy's suggestion, what we agreed was exactly three days before we're playing with threes here, the hermetic three, um, uh, and, on Laura's suggestion at, at 11, 11 a.m. That's what I was going to do it. I was going to go take the screenshot. And what happened was uh, my, my schedule, my schedule changed. And I wasn't going to be around at 11, 11. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to take it like when I have the time first thing in the morning. And that's where we began. So, uh, or that's, that's how this, this began. And then we shared that. Um, I'm going to present first and, uh, I'll give a little bit of a disclaimer. I just started doing the research uh, this morning. Like I had some ideas popping in my head and then I, I dived in and I didn't know where it was going to take me. And so there are three different kinds of schools of thought. Um, and Laura, start the, the 20 minutes now, please. Uh, uh, there are three different, there are three different um, lines of thought, but they're all interconnected. And, and in what I'm going to share with you is almost going to be more of a data dump because I don't think I'm going to have a, a complete, uh, like tied in conclusion, but I'm just looking at these three different lines. And, um, and so what I'm thinking is after this, I'm probably going to do put some more thought into it and see if I can tie all the things together. And who knows, maybe we'll all do that ourselves. But with that said, let the games begin. All right. Uh, all right, so we're going to begin right here to share your please install Zoom device. Hold on for one second. Lower your clock. There you go. You've got it. There we go. All right. Okay. All right. So this is what we began with. You could see the screenshot was the 15th. It was 6.43 a.m. And it was A.I. Mayflower, cro uh, crewless crossing of the Atlantic. And then we go here. This is, and this, uh, so this is the, this is the Drudge Report and it links to an article. And so on that article is on the Daily Mail. Uh, this is like their kind of like headline. So it's the key things are um, what a difference 400 years makes. AI Mayflower will be groundbreaking crewless crossing of the Atlantic next month, powered by solar energy. Uh, 
Uh, they talk about all these numbers. Whenever you see numbers, whenever you see numbers like this in a headline, you know, <laughs> this is a well thought out headline. So anyway, there's the first is the obvious is, is um, you know, there is a, a uh, declaration. There is a ritual happening where they uh, from the, the British Empire, they're they're recreating, they're stepping into the energy of what's going to be the next empire that rules from from sun setting sun to rising sun. I think that's what the British Empire was known as. And so and this time, like, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's your AI boss. So like that's you know, we see that happening symbolically. So that's obviously significant. Um, and then what's also interesting, the, the previous time Howdy and I uh, spoke, we talked about Jamestown. And the truth of the matter is Jamestown is the beginning of the British Empire and the United States. But most people's understanding of Jamestown has been uh, uh through the educational process, it's been muddied. Like we're always celebrating the establishment of the pilgrims in Plymouth Rock and Thanksgiving, and that's the beginning, but that's not really the truth. But you do know a little bit about Jamestown because of Pocahontas and John Smith. So it gets murky in most people's mind. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is uh, this is a, a, like a, a, a misrepresentation, like always, a misrepresentation of how they want you to understand the narrative. And so this is this level of the narrative is is more so like meant as like mainstream mind control because it's playing upon that mainstream mind control uh, story that's been going on. So let me go and delve a little bit deeper. So I want to begin here. Uh, the first thing that really jumped out, it's the, this thing is going from Plymouth, England to Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts. Um, reading about Plymouth and you go and you see that uh, Francis Drake, uh, who was known as the dragon, you know, he was the he was a, a real nasty sort of navigator, but a very successful navigator and really got the West Coast. And this guy was trained by John D with navigation, all this sort of stuff. Um, he's from Plymouth, but he was originally born in a nearby <laughs> town, Tavistock. It's about 15 miles away. And if you go and you follow the Tavistock Institute's like main history line and why it's named Tavistock. Like it doesn't go back to this town. Like, you know, I, I only looked for a little bit, but like that's not like a, 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 a an obvious sort of um, connection. But nonetheless, it, it's there. And my guess is, you know, it's, <laughs> as you'll see, there's like, you know, more and more which supports that. So now going back to the image, the image of the boat, which they showed was only this like on top um, shot from like a satellite perspective of the the footprint of the ship. Like there's no other image in the article which shows you the profile, like what we normally think about a ship. And it's a rather striking ship. They only show this. This is the image they want to put in. <clears throat> Uh, your mind. And as soon as I see this, I'm like, this just reminds me of the, the Batman emblem, uh, particularly this. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but you can see the archetypical similarities. And that's like the first thing that pops up. Uh, and so this uh, has an uh, AI captain, which uses computer vision automation, Watson technology. Uh, that's IBM's AI platform. Um, and it's, it's involved a little bit, I think, with like a, a couple other organizations. But this is an expensive boat. It doesn't I, you don't really know who owns it, who's paying for this. Like, you know, that is that's not really disclosed within the storyline. So anyway, let's continue with the Batman. Um, you know, so I did a quick I did a quick search and uh, did Plymouth Batman and immediately came up with uh, in the, the, the Batman movie, which is another Christopher within the Christopher Nolan franchise, um, the next the next iteration of the Batmobile seems to be uh, a modified 1970 uh, Plymouth Barracuda. And so particularly, you know, within my research, like the automobiles in Nolan's books or Nolan's movies are always significant. And this is significant. It's always the Batmobile is a big part of the motif. And so we see how this is being linked into like the collective in a lot of different ways. And then also with the symbology of Barracuda. Remember, we saw the dragon. Now we're looking at the Barracuda. We're seeing all of this sort of in the backdrop. Um, and then I did a little bit more searching. And then I saw that this was last year. This was uh, or two years ago, I guess, 2019, right around the the. Um, right at the, the, the autumnal equinox, um, 
the Senate House, which is located in the city of London, they uh, um, they had the bat symbol placed upon the building like this was done. Um, you know, the iconic bat signal. And, and we see this as, you know, it's not exactly the same day as the, the Mayflower, but like, you know, the Mayflower is all about right around the same time. Uh, in fact, it may even be the same date, depending upon um, the time in the 1600s uh, when they when they did this it was still during the transition from like the Gregorian to the or the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. So, you know, this could very well if you if this is on the old date, which they call it still this, it could still be the same. But nonetheless, we see it lines up. So we got a we got a link right there. And um, and so we go and we look right here. We do a little bit more of of Tavistock. When was Tavistock founded? September 20th. So it's like all about <laughs> this kind of date sort of stuff. And then we're going to go and look at this. Uh, this here is where Tavistock is headquartered in the city of London. This right here is where the state, uh, the Senate House building. They're two less than two miles apart. Um and uh, all right, we'll keep on going down with this. Christopher Knight, this is, uh, I did a video a while back and I did uh, a presentation and I made a very, very strong linkage between uh, Christopher Knight's Dark Knight Rising with the London Games, which happened in the same place it was premiered with like Boris Johnson and, and the coronavirus and all this sort of stuff. So uh, that link, you know, I'm not going to go into it now, but but that has been established. So we know you that there's Christopher this... Nolan, right? You keep saying Christopher Knight. Do you mean Christopher Nolan? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Christopher Nolan. Thank you for correcting me. Um, and then we see this right here. Uh so, so the point I'm trying to make is there, there's been a long connection with uh, Christopher Nolan, with the modern, with what's going on right now and, and all sorts of, of other types of like, you know, hypnosis and secret messages or whatever we want to call it. So I also wanted to point this out, this from the same article, it says the Senate House, the Senate House is where this is being shown, which is like Christopher Nolan's uh, alma mater. And um and we see that building in previous years has been lit up green in support of mental health awareness. And so if you know your, your mainstream Tavistock uh, purpose, it's all about like understanding psychological issues and stuff like that, mental health. So we see another linkage going on right there. So now we want to go a little bit deeper with the Batman thing. And the, in the, this next iteration of the Nolan, of the Nolan Batman um, movies is not starring Christian Bale, but starring uh, Robert Pattinson. And so Robert Pattinson, um, if you know from Tenet, he plays like kind of like the, 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 the handler, if you will, the guy who knows what's going on for the CIA. Uh, he was first introduced to uh, the collective consciousness as the Cedric Diggory in the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, where he was literally the golden boy and he sacrificed to the Dark Lord. Uh, and he's also really well known for playing a vampire. These are all the types of archetypes which is tied into this guy. Um, so I'm going to pause on this line right now and I'm going to go down, start looking at um, another line and I'm going to I'll link it up a little bit more. But 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 this is like kind of like this Batman AI sort of thing. So now we're going to go back to the actual article itself. And um, I mentioned how how. Uh, um, IBM is involved and the other organization which is involved, which is noted in the article for being involved is this uh, um, public charity pro mayor. And this is from the article. It's been uh, it being this this trip, this Mayflower trip has been made in partnership with the University of Plymouth. Autonomous craft specialist M subs tech firm IBM and public charity Promar. So we know IBM is like a big name company, right? And we know, and we can assume that M subs is probably at least within their their line of of work. Uh, you know, they're probably cutting edge. And then we've got this Promare. So the natural assumption is that Promare should be on that same tier. Like there's a this is all being managed on a very very high level, and things tend to be like on the same tier. They're all like you know if they're globalist organizations and so forth. So this here is the Promer website. Maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger right here so we can see it. Uh, 
And here you could see this is the Mayflower 400. And, and when I pointed out before, like, like this is an interesting, striking ship. And to only show like the top of it, like they didn't want you. They, someone chose like, yeah, this doesn't make sense. People wouldn't be interested in looking at this. I think people are going to be a whole lot more interested in looking at this because this is just like, you know, it, it's got more detail, more things you could take in. So there's the website. It looks all legit. And then you go and you read about their mission. And so it says established in 2001, it's to promote marine research and exploration throughout the world. So again, we're tapping into this, like, you know, uh, Francis Drake exploring, uh, taking over the world with, with, uh, in the name of the British empire. Um, and then it says our team of experienced archeologists and marine professionals. So this is, this is, uh, we're, we're beginning to understand that this, this, this trip is 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 very very um, archaeological perspective. Uh, they're looking for something. Uh, marine professionals execute a variety of research projects independently in concert with academic, corporate, public, government organizations, and they're designed to advance man's knowledge of history and science. So all of this is like meaningless garbage, which could be interpreted exactly how, you, you know, their intention could be very different than how you're going to go and read that. So um, where's the other thing? So you go and you look then at their about us. That's all there there's this is all that's said on about us it doesn't tell you a board it doesn't tell you funding like if you're familiar with doing research in organizations like they always tell you this this tells you absolutely nothing they just tell you this like this 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 general mission so then it says contact us and it's this president ice Atuz, and it's this small, like, you know, it's a P.O. box. I guess there is a street address tied to it. There's nothing told about this organization. And of course, so it's that, Water Street. I love course, that it's Water Street. It's yeah. Water Street. So you go and you look a little bit deeper at who this 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 president is, and you could see it, uh, it here. The title is listed as chief archaeologist. And you look at the, the work which this person does, their specialty. Their specialty mm -hmm. is Maltese maritime history. <laughs> like, what, what? I thought this was about the pilgrims. Why are you getting the world's greatest interest on the Maltese maritime history? So you dig a little bit deeper, and she's best known for this book. Uh, uh, I didn't even write to the title. I didn't copy the title. I think it's in here. It's called... Uh, I think this is the name of a trade, piracy, naval warfare of the central Mediterranean, the maritime history and archaeology of Malta. And so this is like the description of the book. And so is so for people who uh, for millennia, Malta has been considered a site of strategic importance from the Phoenicians to uh, the 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 knights of malta like like this is this is all like this ancient maritime civilization this is what this this person is an expert on and she writes this book and then it says this, this is what the book's about you read this and you think you the title and you read this beginning you think you know what the book is about but this is what it is um let me find the line right here um Altuitz's conclusions are of great importance of the history of Malta and the Mediterranean in general. So you're like, all right, what did, what, what did she find out? What did she find out? What's this all about? And her archaeological discoveries about ships are a major contribution. Uh, oh, God, that's not the line I'm looking for. Um, she builds a convincing argument that Malta mattered far less in maritime history than has been previously asserted. That's what this is about. This woman isn't about telling you anything new. She's about hiding the past. Oh, no, Malta doesn't matter. All that sort of stuff on all of my research, on all of this stuff, I've come to the conclusion of completely the opposite of searching this, that none of this matters. So, like, we kind of have an understanding of maybe what this, this mission is about besides its symbolic mission. So let, let me go. Uh, how much time do I got left, uh, Laura? Four minutes. Four minutes. All right. So there's a bunch I got to cover. Um, I'm going to cut through this. Um, oh, same time. Exactly the same time. This is May of last year. An anime film by the same name, Pro Mare, is released. And it's all about releasing these spirits that are trapped in the middle of Earth, these fire spirits. And if you're familiar <laughs> with uh, Michael Sarian's work on John D, like he's saying that's exactly what all this stuff's about. 
So uh, I found this. I'm not going to go into this deeply, but this is this guy who is associated with the University of Plymouth. Uh, he's involved and he is a neuroscientist involved with uh, Cognavo, which is research and training in the emerging field of cognitive innovation, um, which is connected to like the EU. It's connected to this Marie, Marie, Mary. How do I pronounce her name? Mary. Mary. Thank you. Uh, all the globalist sort of stuff. This guy is writing all about, he's got this website and it's all about conspiracy theories. And if you read it, it's, it's very like he's su seemingly supporting all of these globalist conspiracy theories. But at the same time, when you read about his work, it's all about, um, it's dealing with quant how quantum uh, theory is highly pertinent to psychology, neuroscience, and he's going into it like really, really weird sort of brain stuff in the same way that James Holmes, who's connected to uh, the Dark Knight Rising, is connected to all this really strange brain stuff. He's connected to the same institutions in the same place. Um, and then uh, this is the last thing um, I want to point out because this has to do with AI and the coming, like, you know, the coming uh, AI, uh, <laughs> you know, what's coming. So at the same time as this, this happened on the 15th, today's the 18th. So on the 17th, this, this story started becoming very popular, Biden going on the, uh, on going to the border. And if you're not familiar with this, there was like this video where uh, this is a screenshot where it's quite evident that that Biden is cut right into this. You know, this is whether this was done by human or AI, like this was just this was just created uh, just for anyone who's curious. Newsweek says very, very clearly that this is false. That this is not because the, the Washington Post came out with another picture, which proves that it was it was all fine. Um, but I want to point this out. Uh, I bring this up a lot is um, is the movie Wag the Dog. And these are just screenshots from Wag the Dog where they're literally showing how, um, you know, teams of people uh, are. And this was came out in 1997 using green screens and so forth. They they create uh, um, this. They create an actual news footage, which looks like it's real. And we go and we look at this. Um, and, and we see it's the exact same thing. Like all of this, this is like this A, and this goes back to movies and movies programming and maybe like releasing information, but then also telling you how it's done. Like that's what we're looking at right now. Like if you're familiar with this movie, this is the exact scenario of what, what, what is happening. And I just want to go and show this one little, uh, if you are familiar with this video, it's like 10 seconds. It's definitely worth watching it. Um, it has on the green screen in the background, which makes no sense. This is supposedly like the White House lawn and you've got this woman, you see her. It's like, this isn't like a, this isn't like the, 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 the special or the protection of the president. What do you call those folks? A uh, secret Thank service. This woman is like, she looks like an Amish witch. You know, this is how they dress. Yeah. Like, you know, in this very kind of that time, all in black with the black tights and the black bonnet. And she's just walking around here. Like, it makes no sense whatsoever. And if you're familiar with that scene from, which I was just showing you from Wag the Dog, that's exactly what they have. You see this woman? She is dressed completely in this outfit. And we've got it like right here in the background of this like unbelievably horrible like green screen application. So I went a lot of different places. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to coming and tying it all together much, much tighter. But I wanted to squeeze as much as that I could in 20 minutes. That wasn't easy to do. So with that, I hand the uh, I hand the baton into the. Um, into the center for questions and or comments. Emily, give it a start, you go first. So I don't know that I have um, a lot of questions. I love this because there was almost no, no similarities between what I got, right? But what I got from it. So I love that there were so many different takes on it. Um, but you, the, the Batman thing is interesting, right? The Batman thing is interesting. And um, one of the things about that, sh that over that, what it looked like from overhead and what that Batman symbol is. If you actually look at the spinal column from top down, that it's, it looks exactly the same as the Batman insignia. 
So I think that was kind of interesting. So one could one way of perceiving it is that center part of the ship could be like some sort of representation of a spinal column type of thing because it's a similar similar thing. I, I don't know. That was pretty good and completely totally somewhere else that that I thought you'd go with it. But of course, there's always the few usual suspects there, right? The Tavistock, the whatnot, and everything, you know, like multiple ways of perceiving anything. That doctor who is uh, like James Holmes with the, you know, he seems like he's into conspiracy, but what he's really talking about is quantum ways of understanding brain interface technology, right? And so uh, that's, that. to me, that's what this all ultimately sort of comes down to. But I don't really have any questions. I'm just like, I love how different that, I mean, it's completely different take than I got. I love it. So anyway, howdy, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll bring up uh, to see what Michael wants to comment on this. And, and of all the things that you talked about in there, the thing that interested me for uh, questioning about was the Malta. Uh, because Malta is, of course, um, one of the great archaeological sites in the world. The, the, the sites there are beyond old and beyond spectacular, but I'm curious because of the, of the uh, how you think this might play in. The United States is known, of course, for these two historic starts, Jamestown and Plymouth, that's considered these two. Now, this particular voyage that's being done now is being linked through these various connections to Malta. Therefore, in a sense, you can say linked to um, St. John Hospitaliers, right? It's linked to the Knights of Malta. So are we potentially seeing a very sneaky presentation of the colony that, that okay, this is the assumption that the history we have is complete garbage, that other than two groups landed in the United States at kind of these two places, let's take that as fact and all the other information is false. Could the group that landed in Jamestown have been the Knights Templar? And the, that the links of everything of that colony links to uh, the history of the Templar Knights and the Plymouth colony was the Knights of Malta coming to try to find them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say undoubtedly the, um, uh, yes, like yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the connection with, with Malta and, and to me, uh, and, and to that part of the world and that part of the history, which we're kind of told about. Um, and undoubtedly there's, you know, found throughout North America, there's lots and lots of evidence of like the Phoenician ancient connection being, being here in North America. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I, I certainly hold that like most of like the, the secret societies that, that we know about, like they overlap in a lot of ways. And particularly as it relates to Jamestown, uh, like there's a there's there's an undeniable amount of evidence which shows that the entire thing was planned out by uh, the Rosicrucian branch, which includes Francis Bacon. Um, and so that's a little bit of a different time than than like, let's say, the Knights of Malta or the Templars. But somehow like you know I've, I've read different analysis i just don't know but like there's a connection one way or the other whether they're enemies or whether they're the same or whether they're paralleled but undoubtedly like there, there's something there and i would imagine like s people with like a greater understanding of those connections of of like those those historic those secret societies that you know aren't so secret because we know about them uh uh that I would be very curious to 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 hear. Right. That I'm, just, or, or I'm bringing this up, of course, because I have one video that I've done where I talk about where I consider the Knights Templar and the and Saint John's Hospitalitiers are the equivalent of like the total opposite antithesis of each other. They are meant to look they they they're presented the same, but they're the complete opposite. And then you've got all of this happening in the 1600s. In this period of the 1600s, I'm just going to do in the next video on what was happening in France the story of the, of the Renle Chateau story and how the 1600s was sort of the creation of these next level of secret societies for people like John O'Lear and, and St. Sulpice. And they were the ones who had like founded Montreal personally and they founded. And so I'm wondering if a lot of these original foundings are happening in this time, there's a reason they're coming to North America and there's, there's, a, there's an entire uh, underlying 
structure that no one wants to be told of what's the reasoning and what's the reasoning in that exact time frame it's happening. And then that they want to do this um, journey now, given what you just told me, is indicating that they are they're they're wanting to marker something, but they want, like you say, they, they kind of ignore Jamestown in the in the ceremonies, right? That ceremony was kind of hidden away. It was very quiet. This one they want to make much more public, much more big. So they want to, everyone wants to focus on the Plymouth story and ignore Jamestown. And that's what's kind of telling me again what the research is presenting. Wow. Yeah. Uh, why, do you want to go now? I mean, I think now's a good time. I, I want to hear where you, I don't want you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do you take it away? I, I hadn't got it. I hadn't gotten into any of that kind of thinking when I was starting. I was just listening to Michael and hearing what was going to come of it. You know, for me, when I got that piece of information, I kind of just sat for a while and hung out with my leg injury. I was, um, I was thinking, I, I sort of three things came up. But of course, the first thing that comes up generally any anytime is, well, this is just a story. It's a piece of mythology. We know nothing about history. We don't know even if there is a history. We, we you know, we know absolutely zero. So it was do I really want to dig in too much into the history itself? Maybe not. Okay. The second thing that came up was the similarity of this trip with Thor Heyerdahl and his trip around the world, what was it, the 1930s or something, where he was trying to prove the, the sailability of the ancient ships. And he sailed, I can't remember, to Polynesia or that first trip, right? Where, um, so that was the second thing that came in, the, the link with Thor Heyerdahl and, and is, there, is there something with that? The third piece then that, that caught my attention though more was the idea of these of the Puritans, who was supposed to be who's landing at Plymouth Rock and who's starting this colony, this very specific religious concept. And to me, of course, when you think of Puritans, that leads to two things: this this idea of repression, particularly repressed sexuality and repressed expression, and and repressed um, repressed emotion, sort of a very almost robotic. AI kind of thinking in a, in a, almost like you're wondering, first of all, if there really were Puritans, are they robots kind of because of the way they're, the way that they are presented, it's so non-human, right? It's so non-human as to how they would live their life. And I happen to be reading because at the end of every birthday that I have, uh, one of the things I do is I read, reread the bridges of Madison County. It's, it's a, it's a book that has personal significance to me for various reasons and of course that book which is so well written and so well presented and think that a lot of people can't even understand the the depth that uh, Robert Waller is putting into that book is all about this 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 uh, level of emotion and level of connection and and everything that is even beyond um the beyond the beyond us when it happens to us like it literally takes us over it literally it, and it um uh, I would say not in a way that's um, robotic, but in a way that's totally human, where are so many of our uh, egoic structures and beliefs and wants and filters are like blown apart by this, um, in this case, this force of a, of a coupling with another person that literally does something to us on, a, on another level, on another, on another, um, on another chemical structure almost, right? So if we link this, there's reason for this, Michael. So if we link this back to the Jamestown Plymouth story, you can almost see the Pocahontas John Smith story a little bit as like the Bridges of Madison County story of Robert Kincaid and, and Francesca. That, that there's a lot of the similarities in the story. And of course, the fact that it, it works, but it doesn't work. There's, there's problems to it, but there's, there's this something that is beyond at least the way it's presented, something that is beyond all of their individual abilities to contain that just, it, it, it just pours out of them. That, um, and, and it's so opposite to what pure, there, there would be no bridges of Madison County in Puritan country. It just couldn't be written, right? Just, that just can't happen. So for me, this, this took me, this took me the one angle uh, of which we, you know, I don't want to talk too long so we can discuss this in a little more open format. And then the other format, which we had talked about way before, where I sort of mentioned I had this idea of uh, sports because all three of us have a sports background and have a, 
a background not just of how sports affected our own life and our own growth patterns, but of course, this very strange, what you might call historical story of how the major sports, particularly in North America, all formed, which was, of course, was in the 1800s, which is all formed by very strange circumstances uh, with very odd interconnected occurrences that when you study them don't actually make any sense. But there's this seemingly tie to a much more ancient um, story. So like, you know, was baseball really invented in the 1850s and 60s? Or has it been in North America for hundreds and thousands of years? And it just got in this time frame when the World's Fairs are happening and everything is being turned on its head. You're just getting this reintroduction to the new population of, oh, here's this brand new thing we're calling baseball. Yeah, I know you've got all these cave paintings and things that look like it, but no, that's something else. This is brand new, totally. So when I when I took that Thing, that th that's what came through to me was was this idea of this the presentation of the Puritans and then the presentation of what would be human, fully human, fully alive, fully experiencing life as this counterpoint. And then it just that just linked further to me when you when you just told your story about the the Knights of Malta and then the Knights Templar, which when you look into those two organizations, kind of matches that too. So I'll let you guys just open up comments and questions and, and we can see where this goes. Michael, you go ahead. All right. First off, that was freaking brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the I've been so um, there, there. There's a knowing in me about the the John Smith Pocahontas romance that I'm like, this is really significant, but I couldn't quite like the way it's sold to us, the way that you know, and. It, <laughs> I knew it was important, but I didn't quite understand how it fits in. But when you painted that picture of, of uh, how, you know, we've got these two different, we've got these two different um, uh, symbols, you know, these two different births uh, of, of what would become the United States and, you know, and so one being this Puritan model and what that represents. And then this other one being the human model, but it's hidden. It's in the backdrop, so it's like gonna, and it's and it's like, a, and it's, 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 it feels like a Harlequin romance, right? Like you know, it's, it's, it's like you know, it's just, it's just sold so poorly, and and like what that does in the backdrop of the collective consciousness, and then also what it's revealing, like you know, it, it it's like it gets planted there first, then it comes out. So uh, I love that. I definitely love that. Um, and I thought that was a really, and it makes so much sense why Pocahontas was so significant within Disney. It was literally Disney's 33rd released animated film and, you know, 33 is huge for Disney. Uh, and so it was very, that storyline has to be sold. And then to be able to go and seeing how it's an inversion also of like a, maybe a, a richer, more accurate expression of how human beings also interact. Like that, that was a, that was an interesting point. Um, so that was really just a comment. And then my question for you is, uh, will you I, tell me a little bit more, you, you were speaking so strongly and certainly of like, you know, the roboticness of the Puritans. I'm like, I, I guess I don't really know what the Puritans lifestyle was like so much for that to be the description. So could you just like, tell me a little bit about what the Puritan lifestyle or how they're presented, what that was? Wow. I mean, it's been a long time since I've read specifically Puritan stuff. I mean, now if I go, if I just go online and I look up Puritan, I mean, you, you I mean, you kind of remember the, you know, there's the first thing you think of is no dancing, right? Not allowed to dance, not allowed to, um, I don't even know that. That's what I mean. Like, there's an assumption. Like, that's very clear. And, and again, like I say, with history, we don't know if any of it is true at all. All mm -hmm. we have is the way it's presented. All we have is this is what they're presenting it is. Like, I'm just looking quickly here. Family it, life. And, and that's exactly my point. Like, it's uh, for what's happening. Like, it's almost right. irrelevant if, like, whether it's true or not. It's the story that they're putting in the head. Sure. So the idea of no dancing, like, what else didn't they do? Uh, well, I, I, well, I mean, there was, there, I thought there were rules, I thought it was like rules of like eating, rules of like when you, like, you know, how you could, even how you could sit, certainly how you could dress, right? You had to dress a particular way, you had to sit a particular way. I think you had to be in church a certain number of times per day, 
I, I don't even think it was like a weekly thing. I think it was a daily thing and it was a certain number of times per day. And, and so it was a very, uh, a very structured world from now, if someone out there is a Puritan uh, historical expert, you'll probably poke holes in my story because I'm not. So add to the comments what we need to know about Puritans. But from what I can remember, right, it was very, it, there was this very structured thing with a lot of particular things you couldn't do. Tremendous number of lists. Can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. Um, because, you know, God will will hate you then and, and, and hate the community. I think it was also this thing, if God hates you, God hates the community. So you're not just hurting yourself, you're hurt. He's going to be hurting all of us. I think this was part of the mindset. Um, but when you look into the Jamestown story of how that colony formed and what their beliefs, as you say, are as they're presented, it's very different from that presentation. Uh, I'm still like trying, try, when you're talking about like uh, how you describe the Puritan uh, mindset and the, there was, there's like an implied um, peer pressure in that technique of saying like, not only, like, it's not good enough that, that, that you fall in line just for yourself, but you're going to screw all of us as well, which is exactly the same like story being told of like why everyone, you know, uh, wearing your face covering helps me. It helps, you know, like the, it's the same freight, nothing new under the sun. You know, it's, it's ridiculous to see like, you know, that it's the exact same modus operandi to control by utilizing pressure because we all know that we're part of a group and we don't want to like, we don't want to, there's something inherent that we don't want to upset the group. And what's interesting, I'll just say this one last thing and then I'll, I'll be done, is like uh, just thinking about how the third party or, or the, the cause of the, 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 the pressure in the Puritan model is like coming from God. So this is a very like religious context, which is, you know, particularly from, from my understanding of, of, of how they structure history, it's always in alignment with, you know, the, the procession of the equinoxes. So like the whole church thing for the whole 2000 years is, is very symbolic or very connected to, uh, um, you know, the age of Pisces and that religiosity. And just as we're moving into what they're calling the age of Aquarius, and I'm not saying these things are real, I'm just saying these are the stories which they're presenting. Um, it's all about the group and the rest of the human family. And so the pressure is coming now from the human family. It's like, oh no, you got to do this because you're going to be sticking it to the human family. And it, it's, it's, it's less about the, 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 the previous age way of doing it and more about like you know the the current archetypical storyline so uh that was that was my thought i see emily is just like she can't even be still because she's got to speak so bad well i was actually sitting on the ball because my back is hurting a little bit so that was what that all the movement was about but first of all like my mind is completely blown because i would never have thought to go where you're going with this how but i love how we're all sort of showing up in our in our own way, doing this exactly as we do, right? But your thought about the Puritans being sort of like robots or AI. The very beginning of the story talks about 400 years ago, right? And so it's following certain lines of information that I follow, there seems to be these 400 year cycles, right? And the Plymouth came in 1620, Right. And of course, like we're in 2021, but things really start like 2020 was a pivotal year. Right. Yep. This was actually originally supposed to sail at the end of 2019. Actually, it was supposed to sail really about the same time event 201 occurred. Right. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in this cycle, I think we just keep reliving the same thing over and over in different iterations of it. In, in this cycle, right, is, is AI the Puritans? So are we actually watching the arrival of the Puritans, the arrival of the pilgrims to, to Plymouth Rock right now, like our version of it, right? And so like that, that was my, you know, sort of first thing that I came to yours. And it's going to tie to some things that I'm going to say in mind, but I hadn't thought about it that way. So we're about to witness the arrival of the pilgrims here, right, for in this new updated, more mechanized society that we live in. And then the other thing was you were talking about this sort of like chemistry that happens in Bridges of Madison County or between Pocahontas and, and uh, John Smith and whatnot. And it, what we're talking about is like this physiological, biological alchemy. And I, for a long time, have thought that like 
so much of what's gone on with like intentional pairing of people, right? Whether you talk about arranged marriages or you talk about even through some like iterations of MK Ultra or whatever, people are carrying a certain amount of historical information in their body, right? We have all these chemical and biological processes going on. And when two people come together and then there's energy and passion, there's this huge like information exchange as well that like catalyzes new processes. And we watch this in a lot of things. Like you can say it like with types of music, like uh, I like techno and I like house, but tech house is its own genre that is really interesting. You see it in fusion cuisine, right? Like, which is, which, you know, becomes popular. You would never think to put these two flavors together, but when you do, wow, you have this magical third flavor that is even better than the two are on their own and whatnot. And this is like really high magic. This is high alchemy, the pairing of people that way to initiate a process of change in a new location. Like it's almost like the catalyst, like in some sort of bomb or fission or fusion or that kind of stuff, right? So those were my like two big takeaways. And then when you were talking about the Puritans, like, and you said you weren't allowed to dance, it made me think of the movie Footloose, right? Which was part of the movement, they, they weren't allowed to dance, which was part of the movement that launched us into like dance music culture between flash dance and footloose that launched us into break dancing and dance music culture, which eventually led to the underground parties and rave scene. And just so you know, here in Los Angeles, where there is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting underground dance music scenes ever, in the early 2000s, it switched from being a scene that was mainly around house music and other stuff to a scene around, it's developed around techno. And it was with the introduction of a group here, like a, 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 coll a collaborative group that threw parties and they were called droid behavior. And they, they introduced this idea of really interfacing a lot of technology with the music. They were, all, it was very, I mean, it was very creative the way they did it but it was basically a demonstration of music and technology, it, it kind of like a merger of man and machine, right? And they used Los Angeles as almost like a backdrop or a stage set for the way that they did their parties and created their music. It has a very Los Angeles feel to it, but it's a very like moving into the AI future kind of music, right? And it really revolutionized the underground dance music scene here in, in Los Angeles, right? And in some ways it took for some people, I'm sure it came along at the same time that droid phones and stuff like that were coming out. Like it almost seemed to, I'm not sure which one it was that the Android phones wrote on the energy of droid behavior or that they wrote on the energy of Android phones. It was kind of like a current that was moving through the system, right? But some people would say that, you know, it took some soul out of the music. I don't think so. I, I, I see it slightly different, but some people would say that. Right. And so in some ways it, it made it less human. It turned it into something more robotic or AI. So there we go. That's my uh, that's my takeaway from what uh, <laughs> from what Howdy said. Do you guys have anything to say about that before I sort of go with mine? I don't know, really. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, it's. Um, we're in such a strange period of history when, and, and we're in such a strange energetic structure. And of course, everything comes down to energy. Everything comes down to not what we're doing or what we're seeing, but even what we're perceiving, but what we're feeling. And it's very hard even to feel normally about anything at this point. It's like the, 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 the energetic uh, cocoon that we live in is so uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Has so has such a strange uh, a charge in it now. It's such a strange electromagnetic charge that it makes it really hard to even feel um, our environment and ourselves normally. You might say. So uh, again, that's linking in again back to all of these stories and further and further and further in history. You act about cycles. Well. And, and to me, that was to me, that was the most interesting thing you said. Are we seeing mm -hmm. is 1620 happening again? So the, that that we're we're getting, you know, in a sense, we're getting a time loop, but the time loop isn't exactly the exact same time loop. Ned Ryerson exactly is not coming up on the street and talking to us. It's going, but there's a Ned Ryerson like experience. There's a Ned Ryerson like thing that you would be able from a distance be able to say, oh yeah, 
it's the same thing. It's happening again. It's so that's also really curious to potentially look at the at now 1620, 1621, 1622, at least how it's presented and see how does that match six, eight, 2020, 2021, 2022. And we can maybe we can maybe make some really good predictions if we get a good handle on that time frame. So that's what came to me from listening to yeah. your comments. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go nope. with mine now. All nope. right, let me just get my to my first page. Okay, so the first thing I have a lot of notes here, huh? I need my phone. I need my phone. Okay. Okay. So, oh. Okay. All right. I see. I see the time. Okay. Laura has to have something she has to step out for. Okay. So first of all, I have to comment about the source where this came from, which was I think the Daily Mail, right? And that website. I, I don't go there very often, and it's like an assault of like all these ads and like weird moving things, like some sort of like game on there and whatever. So my first takeaway from this was this entire website is not about the articles. The articles are part of it but it's about the interplay of the articles and the advertisements and the way they're letting us know that this is a game and parts of the code are in the ads and parts of the code are in the article and nothing is what it seems and whatnot. And this is actually like in a, a multi-system kind of game type of thing. So that was crazy. I don't go to that website often. And I was like, okay, like this is interesting. Like I had weird stuff going on on my phone while I was what, you know, reading it. But we've already talked about the 400 year cycle. I'm just gonna go through my general notes and then I'm gonna give my theory. The first thing I thought, my intuition when I looked at that ship was that it looked like some sort of a bio, like a medical device or a bioweapon, like a needle or a syringe with some sort of genetic sequence down the back of it. So immediately I was primed towards this is some sort of like something to do with biology or a bioweapon or something like that, right? Okay, so then of course the next thing I noticed was that they're calling it MAS. I'm really into trying to understand the coding of things and other things that the same acronyms code for and how those things are related. So Mayflower Autonomous Ship is MAS. I'll return to this because this is the source of a good portion of my, my stuff, right? So <clears throat> there's no human captain or crew, right? But they didn't say that there wasn't like a cyborg or a robot or anything like that. They didn't talk about that, but they just said no human captain or crew, right? And they gave us a little bit of history about the pilgrims were fleeing religious persecution and going to set up a, a, a settlement in the new world, right? But this time, the, the purpose of the trip is this uh, is to gather critical scientific data about the ocean. So we have religion versus science, right? So they were, and this, the science here is powered by AI, solar, and IBM Watson, right? So this is arguably the Green New Deal, eugenics, and the New World Order. Right, so we have religion versus science. So 1620, right? Like it, it's just a different, we have a new religion and our religion is science. It's not Puritanism anymore, right? Okay, so the operators tell it where to go and how to get there. Doesn't really say who the operators are. It, um, let's see, uh, it considers weather, currents, collision regulations, which I thought was a weird term. What is, a, what is collision regulations? Like there's certain things it's allowed to hit and other things it's not, um, and other variables. Right, it said it was revealed that this ship was revealed in 2017. They didn't say it was built or finished or whatever. It was revealed, which leads me to believe that it existed before then. Just like a lot of these Tartaria buildings or whatever, like maybe they were discovered, not built, or different kinds of, you know, like a lot of things they say that they made up or that they discovered, they actually just found them, right? So this is revealed. Maybe this is some kind of technology from some other place or some other time, and then that was supposed to leave in 2019, but it was delayed due to coronavirus, right? So that I felt like that was kind of interesting. All right, biggest challenge is the ocean itself. No ship has ever been built that can survive whatever the ocean could throw at it. So if this survives whatever the ocean throw at it, does that mean that it wasn't built, right? Kind of thing or something like that. It was weird the way the sentence was, was sort of put together. So it's gonna gather data on whale numbers and traces of plastic in the ocean as part, it, it, maybe that's not the only thing, but that's what they highlighted. And it's gonna use the IBM AI platform, which includes computer vision, automation software, and Watson, okay? So, and Watson is basically an update of the IBM eugenic system that was used you know, in the past, right? Okay, they use it for all sorts of things. Now, Watson is used for sports. You can watch Serena Williams in a commercial about Watson. Watson is used for all sorts of stuff, right? And this is, of course, 
IBM, it's connected to Bill Gates and all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> um, this uh, Mayflower autonomous ship will mark four centuries since white Europeans stepped off the Mayflower and onto America's shores, right? <clears throat> and they, they've the Mayflower Compact of 1620 was the first governing document of the Plymouth colony, right? So they're talking about white Europeans and governing documents. And right now we're talking about like throwing over the, the, like a changing of the guard. If you look at like what's been going on with the queen and Meghan Markle and Harry and what's going on in our own government. And are we gonna move towards technocracy? What's gonna be, are we gonna get rid of the constitution? All of this kind of stuff. So this lines up sort of like 1620, 2020, like with what's going on this process that we're in. Um, the, this is a, the uh, MAS is a machine rather than a floating hotel. I thought that was an interesting uh, description, right? Like this is a machine. And so when you remove the human factor, you can focus on mechanics and function, right? And think about everything that we're being told right now is removing humans from the picture for a more, you know, well-functioning sort of, business or society or any of that kind of stuff. There's no living quarters, just rooms with science experiments set up. So there's basically laboratories on board with no humans conducting said experiments, but that's what's in the, the inside of the ship that, you know, there's like a, a drawing of it that's shown in the article somewhere, right? So um, let's see, this, this was an interesting sentence to me, right? They're going to use, they're going to do water analysis, like water analysis. One of the labs is for water analysis that will test samples of seawater and store in bottles for a, a human worker to inspect on arrival. So to me, that is, they either have something on board or they're looking for something that they're going to store up. And when the person opens the bottles, there's your chemical reaction. There's your bioweapon. Because they said a human worker. That's the only discussion of any human involved in it is that a human worker is going to open and inspect the bottles of things that were collected, right? So that's the only discussion of a human. And to me, that's where there can be some sort of biological transference that takes place. All right, so the last thing was, there was a quote that's from the guy who, who's in charge of this, who said, let's be inspired by what pilgrims did and jump off into a new beginning, right? So this is, when this thing lands here, it's gonna be the new world or the new world order, just let, or whatever, just like it was the new world when the pilgrims arrived. So we're in that complete cycle. So I did that. And then one of the things Michael and I have been focusing heavily on in our Project Kids and Glass Bead Game series is this code naming of things and the coding, right? And we have just noticed that a lot of times there's a parallel between a biological or chemical process in the body and like a monetary system, like on the stock market or cryptocurrencies, they'll have like the same acronyms. We've also been looking at like when there's an acronym that we're suddenly being hearing all the time over and over and over, what else carries that same acronym? And like, are they sort of being powered by each other? Are they getting people to focus on one to power another? Like what's going on with that? So I looked up MAS and uh, I got a lot of stuff, right? So first it obviously means more in Spanish. Um, there is something in, called MAS in LA that builds initiatives that promote neighborhood resilience and elevate the agency of working class communities of color. So we have like the social justice kind of thing being coded for there. We have uh, MAS, most of, there's a lot of medical stuff. So there's MAS is a leading New York state Medicaid transportation provider. So there's another situation of moving something that could be a biological or something like that in nature, or even just moving people from place to place. MAS is the code for Malaysian Airlines, which is interesting because there was an interesting occurrence with Malaysian Airlines a couple of years back that I recall, right? That there's a cartoon called Mas y Mas. There are pop songs that are called Mas, multiple of them. Um, let's see. Mass Holdings is the large, one of the largest conglomerates in Sri Lanka. That's also coded MAS. Their Mazco Corporation stock is coded MAS. Um, there's a real estate stock in South Africa that's coded that. There's something called, uh, through, uh, I think, the South African government called the Multiple Awards Schedule. <clears throat> there is, MAS is a company that provides medical staffing, right? So more medical stuff. MAS is a military auto source. MAS is the monetary authority of Singapore. And then I got into 
two other things. Are there people being coded by this? And then what is the biological? Like I, I went to go look sort of at the biologicals of this, right? But before I did that, I went to Wikipedia to see if there was a Wikipedia entrance for MAS. And some of it are what I found on my own regular search, some stuff about film and TV and songs, but in computing, MAS 90 is accounting software. There's something called the Motu audio system. There's something called the multi-agent system, which is built of multiple interacting agents, right? So we can think of this as chemicals or as people, right? If in operations kind of stuff. There's also malware analysis system by FireEye. Okay, obviously there's a lot of educational um, things because ma master of advanced studies, that kind of stuff. There's a, a, a torpedo boat, an Italian motor torpedo boat that's called a MOS as well. So I'm assuming maybe that that has a close correlation to what the actual structure is. Um, there's a French government arms factory. There's some of these other things that I've already mentioned, but there's something called Muerte a Sequestadores, Death to Kidnappers. It's a paramilitary group. There's the Mongolian Academy of Sciences, Municipal Art Society, Muslim American Society, MacArthur Astronomical Society, like several things, right? There's a few places, but then down here in politics, it's all about socialism. There's a movement for socialism in Argentina, MAS, right? There's a movement for alternative socialism in Belgium, right? There's a movement towards socialism coded MAS in Bolivia. There's a broad movimiento amplio social in Chile, right? Socialist alternative movement in Portugal, right? So they're all about socialism, right? Which is attached to this Green New Deal and bio warfare and eugenics and all this stuff that we're coming into. And then I got to the, the biology, right? And the biology MAS is the macrophage activation syndrome. Michael, you talked, we talked about macrophages a few weeks back. Right. There's a couple of other things, but the one that I really fo there's there's mixed amphetamine salts, which I used to take. <laughs> but the one I really focused in on was marker assisted selection. Marker assisted selection. So let's look what market assisted select uh, marker assisted selection is. <clears throat> Hold on just a second. I have some things on my phone and some things on the computer here. Marker assisted selection or marker aided selection is an indirect selection process where a trait of interest is selected based on a marker, morphological, biochemical, or DNA, RNA variation linked to a trait of interest, i.e. productivity, disease resistance, abiotic stress, rather than on the trait itself. This process has been extensively researched and proposed for plant and animal breeding. For example, Using MAS to select individuals with disease resistance involves identifying marker allele that is linked with disease resistance rather than level of disease resistance. But this is also used in like high frequency with gene or quantitative traits, right? So look at what's going on right now with all of this focus on our biology, on mRNA vaccines, on, you know, if you go back and there's the conspiracy, I don't know, it's hard to determine whether it's true or not that like some of these vaccines were trying to like find the God marker and remove people's connection with God, right? Uh, that they've so there's been people who've talked about like trying to remove the trait that leans towards questioning authority or conspiracy theorizing or things like that, right? So I went there and then the last thing I did was I went to go see, I found this person, right? And this person's name is um, Maz, let me find my thing, where did he go? Where did I put him? Maz, M-A-S, Sajadi. Right. And Maz Sajadi, his, his quote is change your frequency, change your life. Maz Sajadi is the founder of exponential intelligence, metamorphosis spelled like medical, right? And med, he, medi healing has helped tens of thousands around the world break through challenging situations in their personal and professional lives so they can achieve not only success, but significance in their lives. Right. So it's basically a broad based, like, Exponential intelligence is a science-based body of knowledge that Maz Sajadi discovered after his second near-death experience. <clears throat> it explains secrets to success and happiness from a quantum physics perspective. The process removes issues at the core of your being so you can reach your optimum potential and attain rapid and tangible results. He is known through a game as a game changer throughout the world as well as one of the best kept secrets for high-profile individuals. 
on another page, he has like, uh, he's talking about some new exclusive 12 month membership thing he has called Breaking the Matrix, right? And in some ways it sounds like, you know, a very um, patented and technological version of what you and I have been doing, Michael, as we're playing the glass bead game and trying to figure out how to travel through dimensions. And it says here under Breaking the Matrix, I'm just gonna read like a tiny piece of it. It says, uh, um, it's his most advanced program to date. As Moss comes into his full abilities, unprecedented knowledge and downloads come more frequently during personal meditation, sleep, and often unexpectedly. The answer to humanity's deepest questions are being revealed. The meaning of existence, the secrets to fulfillment and purpose, the true physics to navigate life, ways to end the struggle, to see beyond the matrix, to be the masters of our universe, and to push the boundaries of what it means to be human. So what I see this is, is some sort of ritual to the changing of what it means to be human. And this is going to happen through a biological technological process. And this is the ritual. This is the, the trek, like you go, you make the pilgrimage to Mecca and you have your ceremonies to bring in whatever the new kind of thing is. This is the trip across the ocean. They're gonna land and this new thing is going to be generated. And my guess is gonna be that there's going to be some sort of alchemical reaction when the whatever is collected or whatever is in these bottles or whatever is opened by the human worker and whether that actually like ignites the, the release of a bioweapon here like remember there was if you follow the work of people who've been really tracking hard like the documents related to event 201 and the patents related to things there was a rule that there had to be drills that were at least a year long before something could happen Right, so we're now at basically a year since the drill of event 201 began, right? So maybe this all has been a drill and maybe this is the real thing. Maybe this is gonna be the real whatever being released, you know? And there's all these, there's some Asian connections in the MAS coding, but Michael and I often talk about whenever they're blaming something on the Asians and the Russians, it's usually the British empire doing it, <laughs> doing it right? And since this comes from Plymouth, right? And, and and they send all of their, you know, things that will eventually come over here and govern and rule us sort of via this route. That's kind of what I got there. So the other thing is that ship, like it actually looks kind of like a syringe, like needles. And there's like the longer needle and then the two side needles. And if you understand how the mRNA vaccine works, there's one needle that delivers the payload. And then there's these little side needles that basically vibrate open. They're, they're needles made of sugar. And they basically are the ones that like shock the cell wall so that it will open because it's not supposed to and allow the payload in. So the way that the mRNA vaccine actually even just works penetration wise looks very much like that. And if you look at the picture, Michael, maybe you can bring the picture of the ship back up. If you look at the picture of the ship, there's like some windows or something on top of it. It almost looks like a DNA sequence. Look at it. You can bring it back up. <clears throat> right? Like when you're looking at like the strips when they do genetic testing, right? These are all sort of, it looks like a strip that, that, that sequences genetics. And these would be the main, this would be the payload here to the changed DNA or the mRNA or the changed genetics. And these would be like the sugar needles on the side that sort of provide the shock to open the cell membrane. So there we go. That's my, uh, <laughs> that's my dump. Anyone? <laughs> Why don't, Michael, why don't you start? I just gotta run. Why don't I start? Well, you need, to, I need to take a breath. I need to take a breath. That was, that was great. That was, that, there, there's so many things to comment on because you, you touched on so many. Um, I'm just going uh, for 30 seconds, but go, I'll be, I'm, I can still hear you. Uh, Ma, the Moss guy, that, the, the, that was definitely, uh, um, th that caught my attention. So uh, what did I want to say? Um, uh, your comments on the Daily Mail, that was really interesting. Uh, no one can take what the, um, the analysis of the, of the wording in the article, I think is really, really, um, that speaks in my language is like the hypnotic sort of stuff, which is put in there and then taking what they're saying very literally. And so uh, I think is a, uh, a really insightful way in terms of, um, understanding the uh 
uh, what what what's being com communicated. Like you know, what's not being communicated is is just as important as what is being communicated. Um, oh, so this is what. So as you were describing, so I, you went full circle. So the, 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 this is my one comment, and and I want to throw this out there. So you talked about like the the next iteration and the opening of the jars or whatever uh, is going to be. And the the person who smells it, and so when you you describe that, you Emily hasn't seen a lot of movies, correct? Like you know the TV shows, but you don't have the movies, so sure. you may very well not know this. But uh, I've made a lot of reference in the past to um, uh, the the Dark Knight series and like how significant it is with all of this. So um, part of like one of the subplots in I think it's the dark i don't remember they all kind of get blended in actually it's i think in two of them it was uh there was a a very specific mind controlling mind numbing uh technology which um this like evil psychologist uh aer aerosolized you know turned into an aerosol form um a type of um a type of hallucinogenic and it's been weaponized to like maximize like, you know, the, the visuals and maximize one's fear. And then like, you know, the, so anyway, as you were, as you were describing the whole experience of like, you know, the, the human being unscrewing and, and, and whatever those canisters are, and then smelling it and having this like very possibly an adverse affection or, or maybe not adverse, maybe that's always the plan. Uh, but like this sort of like mental thing, which we keep coming about, like they did that they showed it a little bit differently but that was that was like in these christopher nolan films and particularly the Night dark knight so i wanted to i wanted to throw that out there um but it was a great real thoughtful presentation thank you and what you were saying like that process like it reminds me like when howdy described john smith and pocahontas right like those were two different kinds of humans that alchemized and created this other thing this would be like a biological chemical and technological and a human sort of merging and there you have like that exact moment of man merging sort of with machine or with technology or whatever right in that moment like that right and so when he described that with the the pocahontas i kind of saw this in like the new way that right like science is the new religion and we're obsessed you know you see people like um are talking about like you know they have attraction to like the sophia ai robot kind of stuff or whatever but i would it's, I, like i think it's not a far off thing that people are also take you know, chemicals or things like that in order to feel those feelings that we used to only feel from the physical passion of romance and attraction and all that kind of stuff. So it's that same, same sort of thing. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, right. Well, where would I take this from here? Where would I, where would I want to ask you a question on this? For, for, um, for me, the interesting part of your presentation was this point that the only experiment that they, they, I mean, they claim they're doing experiments. A part of whatever this trip is doing is it's got some sort of scientific and arche archaeological experimentation. Okay, so first of all, what archaeological um, mm -hmm. uh, thing are they doing on just a controlled ship that's not doing anything? They must then be looking at the, at the sea. I can only imagine they're looking at the sea floor. Is the only archaeological thing they could be doing on, on the trip itself. But the second thing would then be, but they're collecting seawater. Mm -hmm. that they claim this is the one thing that and they wanted to put in art. They're collecting seawater. Now, every ship that travels the world right now can collect seawater. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for this particular vessel to collect seawater. There's, there's, it's not going to be any different from the seawater that whatever's out there today can get. So yeah, so that that again led to me of like, so what are they collecting? Or like you say, what is already on board the ship yep. that is being transported from one place to another? And if we twist this backwards, so what was on the ship that the original Mayflower landed in Plymouth with? What is it that they, did they bring pilgrims or did they bring some people and something else with them. And how could the 
the collection of seawater relate to what might be have been on the original pilgrim ship yeah no I, I, absolutely i mean like did there was there some other process that was initiated based on what they brought there besides the things we know is sort of ideological right so was there some other chemical process or technological process or was it really all a disguise for bringing something over right mm -hmm. <clears throat> what you were saying about um the you know the seawater like what they could be collecting it did talk about like plastic traces and and doing things with whale counts and things like that but that all sounded like nonsense to me you know what I mean? Like it seems, I mean, we've talked a lot about in shows that I've done about the, the, the ocean, like the space as being like, like heavy saline water, like similar to the ocean, right? And lots of us have all sorts of weird wrapped up memories of like underwater breathing in these sort of slimy saline sort of environments and things like this and whatnot. And so I don't know if and you see this in a lot of these sci-fi movies and movies that are obviously revealing certain technologies and mind control programs and stuff like that, that there is some sort of process that is able to happen, you know, either in seawater or in water tanks. You have like John Lilly's work with dolphins and, uh, you know, different, pro you know, LSD and things like that. So we've ta I've talked about that in a number of ways, and I've talked to many people over the years with that. But I think it's really more that that's just a story and that there's something being brought over, right, that is going to initiate it. And my point with doing all the things I did with the coding of MAS is that we've noticed that like this is used a lot on like Twitter and texting and on the internet, people no longer say words, they just say these acronyms, right? We have like AOC and we have the PPP and the this and the that. So we have this ship that is MAS, right? And then there's all of these other things that have those same codes. So this is first of all, receiving a lot of energy from wind and solar, but also from people paying attention to it, right? How much does it activate all of these other things too? And are they sort of connected, right? Like when something is so focused on and said so many times or typed so many times, it's kind of like an incantation. It's part of the alchemy is like how much energy is brought to the ceremony, how much attention is paid to it, how much power is behind it. And so you have the power of like the sun and the wind and the technology, but also the power of all the people involved in all the things of a similar name that sort of go into this alchemical moment. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Michael, if you want to go ahead, but I just happened to, while you were talking there, I just decided to look up the, how did the ship get the name Mayflower anyway? Like, why is it called the Mayflower? Yeah. And then I realized that the Mayflower is the lily. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lily, which yeah. is the main, you know, that's the, the historic symbol. emblem of of the of the French dynasties yeah. and the and the entire thing that was going on in France of you know Rennes le Chateau and of course the lily is the key flower of what you might call a, a symbol of awakening in ancient Egypt and in India right it's the flower of coming out of darkness and into light and all these kind of things so it's not really it's you could you you might as well call it you might as well call the ship the lily right the uh, the lotus yep. Yeah, huh. <laughs> that that would involve everybody in a ritual that's different than what they thought it was, right? <laughs> Michael, what was the name of the ship that the uh, that the Jamestown people came on? There are three of them. Like, uh, I think one was uh, like uh, Sarah Maria Marie, um, maybe Godspeed, something like that. So I uh, hey, that's important because it's, it's Sarah Maria. Well, that's the that's the Magdalene. I, don't quote races. me on that. It's it's like that's that's in the ballpark. That's in the ballpark. Well, if it's close, and I mean, if Godspeed, of course, that that links to Hermes. And mm -hmm. so I would be curious what the third ship was. You talk. Yeah, about. yeah, I de I definitely agree. And 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 I've got some stuff I want to also comment about the specific ship which which we're talking about right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so as you were talking about it, like the, uh, the, the, the ship and like, you know, going across the ocean and all of that. And I'm like, hold on. The manufacturer's name is M sub like submarine. I'm like, this ain't no friggin' ship. This is a submarine. Yeah. Like the mm -hmm. entire purpose is to go down. And so I start looking into this company M sub. 
So they're like cutting edge. They're based out of Plymouth. For whatever reason, they're based out of Plymouth and they're what a 100% wholly owned subsidiary for some like shell company in Texas. And so like, and like when you go to the M sub page, there's nothing about, all it says is like all of their contracts, all of the contracts, which they have. And they do like all of this, like cutting edge, underwater, unmanned stuff. And this other group, what's it called? What, what, where was I with this other group? The Submergence Group LLC. It's in Cedar Park, Texas. That's right near where I'm moving. It's about a half hour from where I'm moving. So I go to I go to the I go to their website, and like immediately, it's like uh, uh, caution, caution. This this website stealing your information. Okay, so that what you talked about. So one of the things in Austin, and this goes into where you and I want to go eventually, Michael, right? There is the Colorado River running through. There's what's known as the Edwards Aquifer. And then you, the famous place Barton Springs and whatever. This is all like, there's a lot of water under the ground there. And then there's also the river and all of these springs. And this is one of the locations that when I was living in Austin previously, I had a lot of these bizarre, weird memories of a lot of underwater activity. Right. So this is the submergence group. So I'm just I'm going to have to dig into this when I get there. Right. But remember, I, one of the things that uh, the mass coded for was some sort of multi agent interactivity. Mm -hmm. kind of thing like that. So, that you know, you know, this involves people, too, and something about, you know, underwater sort of technology or worlds or realms underwater or something like that. Right. Like I, there's something else below the surface here. Um, I also, when you were talking about the Lotus Howdy, it made me think of, did you see that thing on New Year's Eve where they did the, the, the AI performance at the Space Needle in Seattle? Did you see that video? Okay, so it was this they, like AI kind of New Year's celebration and it was all centered around the Space Needle and it was like a you know laser light kind of performance, but it was AI. So I remembered that there was one figure that it did that was so it's the space needle it's obviously in bill gates is from seattle and we have these syringes and the vaccines right but one of the images was they showed a um a lotus they showed a lotus this was the, this was on top of the space needle so right it, they showed this is the space needle right here up there and they made this lotus opening on top of it right but do you know what one of the other pictures was on the space needle dna <laughs> Right, there was a bunch of other stuff. It was very interesting. There was a monarch butterfly. There was all the kinds of symbols, but look at this. There's a jujitsu academy in Seattle that is a lotus with the space needle inside it as part of its logo. And then I found this, this, this interesting, uh, there's a tattoo here someone has, like a lotus with needles through it. And then there's another one, where did it go? There was one that was really interesting that was showing uh, a girl's single needle tattoo with a low, oh, where did it go? I can't find it now, right? But sometimes I just do these, oh, here we go. Caps needle art, it's a single needle tattoo with a lotus kind of thing, right? It was just on, the, when I looked up space needle lotus flower, these are some of the things that came up. But um, that, uh, that, that um, video on New Year's Eve was quite interesting. And that lotus and the uh, that DNA were both projected off of the space needle. Hmm. So we're being given this symbolism all, you know, sort of all about. All right, I'm, uh, I'm going somewhere good with this. And this is complimentary to all of that, which you were just sharing. Um, so, uh, all right, where to go and, and show this? Can I hop in for a sec? Yeah, go ahead. All right, here we go. So, so here we have, so this, this is where we've got our, our, our group. This is your, your M sub. And so it says um, submergence group and M subs are sister companies that specialize in the design and manufacture and operation. Um, and it says they're operating uh, from Plymouth, UK, but round, round rock, Texas. That's, That's like where I used to live when she lived there. She lived in round rock. All right. So do you know what round rock is? Huh? So this is Round Rock. Did I switch? Did it? Did it change for you? Sometimes it doesn't change. Can you see the new screen? 
Yeah, Round Rock is that rock in the middle of the creek in Texas. I've been there. We went there last time we were there. Okay, so Round Rock is, this is where they're headquartered. And it's like, you know, it's a small little city. Um, but it has quite a significant connection. So, so we know, we know that this is, as you were saying, like this, that we've got this like ancient sort of maritime connection and all of this symbology that we're seeing with like the, the Malta and the, this and the, that. And now we see the company that's building the ships is like connected to this small town. And this small town is known for one thing. It's named after the prehistoric round top. And like, think about how many small towns like have this as their history. And so the round rock, um, and Williamson County have been the site of human habitation since at least 9200 BC. They're connecting this to a very, very ancient civilization in North America. The area's earliest, earliest known inhabitants lived during the, how do I pronounce that? Does anyone know how? Pleistocene. That word, the Ice Age, the Ice Age. They, they, they dumb it down for people like me and are linked to the Clovis culture. Who are the Clovis culture? But they're the people who are linked to a very specific type of flower. Now, I don't know what flower it is, but my guess is if I had to make a guess, it's the friggin' lily or within the lily family. Yeah. And we got black water, which yeah. is right in the which is right in the name. So it's like we've got all of the same things. And so um, it's linked to this culture based upon evidence found at the Galt site midway between these two places, one of the most important discoveries in ancient times. Like this is not just some random place. This is an important historical location. Uh, just uh, in recent times of an ancient skeletal remains known as the Leanderthal lady. Like this, this is being, they're, they're telling us, they're telling us right now, this is, this is, this is connected. This is some really deep stuff. How excited are you to come visit me now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, okay. I'm just laughing about like the ridiculousness of like what we, the three of us just did. We're like, all right, let's just go with this. And this is like the story which is coming out and how like every piece of, uh, of this, we're each adding this really interesting piece. It's, it's fascinating. Michael, pull that thing you had back up. That thing about the round rock, right? Pull it back up. All right, so one of the things it says here, it studies the, um, the, the Galt site. We all, you guys know about John Galt, obviously, from the Ayn Rand stuff, right? It's a slightly different spelling, right? But the, it's kind of interesting that that's there as well. But it talks about that this is midway between Georgetown and Fort Hood. Fort Hood is the military base just outside of Austin that, uh, that there was the guy who didn't want mm -hmm. on the from but the other thing is over the past few years there have been multiple soldiers that have gone missing or been killed from this base so in my head there's something going on so there's there is ancient underground water in this area of texas right and there's some sort of a, there's that underwater project or program or underwater underwater you know some sort of underground waterway where something is going on related to that which we are speaking about today and my guess would be that some of these missing people from the military like that the answer may lie in whatever we discover is going on here and then the other thing I wanted to say, I'm just noticing now that you, you can stop the share if you want, if you're continuing to look, that's fine. But you had put in the chat earlier and I hadn't noticed it earlier that Puritans equal, equal cancel culture, right? I like that, right? And that Kevin Bacon equals Francis Bacon. And of course we have the six degrees of Kevin Bacon meme that was big, right? Like years ago. So that, you know, maybe Kevin Bacon is the Francis Bacon of this 400 year cycle. Right. Here, apparently so. And like the tie in the <laughs> footloose, the footloose, but you, you have me on footloose. But it's but the interesting thing is like because we think about the the, the cancel culture and the Puritans, if we want to compare them to one another, is like they're just opposite sides of the same coin, because like on a certain level, like, you know, the cancer, the cancel culture is embracing everything that the Puritan culture would not in a way, like particularly as it relates to like maybe say lifestyle and a freedom of lifestyle, but then there's both about shutting everything down. So it's 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 different expressions of, of a very similar uh, archetype. They're both about saying, you can't do that. Yeah, there you go. You can't do that. You and can't do that. It also represents this, in, this sort of switch, this inversion. In 1620, it was about religion. And in 2020, it's about science, 
right? And that we have a scientific or a technological or whatever solution to everything as opposed to like a spiritual, godly, whatever the thing was, right? So it's that sort of inversion. Well, I can, I, I'll, I'll just give in here just to give you another thing to think about. There was a book, which I'm still unpacking. It's not on my shelf. I don't know where it is. It was about a woman, um, something like the Templar's journey to Montreal. I'm not saying that the, the, the the title right but it's 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 a it's about the city of montreal canada and its knights templar connections and when you look back at the formation of montreal quebec city had been formed much long much before that and quebec city was founded and was expected to be run by the knights of malta that the saint john's hospitaliers were to be the the, the runners and this group from saint sulpice led by john olier personally wanted to create a what he called a new Jerusalem in the United States, in, in North America, and named it, of course, after Montreal, the, the Royal Mountain, which they some claim is the is the, the mountain where Montreal actually is, but it links to Montreal de Sauce in southern France, which has a Grail Castle and a Grail Cave rather, and had a Grail Castle on top of it. And so once you start seeing the the again these I'm bringing it up because of the dual symbolism, the symbolism of a of a settlement in one place and then a settlement in another place. And these two settlements are not linked in any way, shape or form. In fact, they seem to be uh, opposers in some way. And the question is which, which settlement group is going to come out ahead of the game. And um, so again, it becomes very, very, I, I would be curious, okay, if a second voyage of some kind is taking place at the same time that's not in the news that's not being talked about that maybe isn't even really known by the people who run the world but there's a second one that's going on right that's getting prepared right now that's going to leave exactly when this mayflower leaves and we are going to again be seeing this dual play out jamestown and plymouth quebec city and montreal whatever is where we're where it's not just, again, we are being presented the one story, the one side, the, the side that the group that controls information now wants us to agree, uh, uh, focus on, but that doesn't mean it's the only thing going on. This is, this is a dual world. So in 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls are found, it's the same year that the Nag Hammadi Codexes are found. You, you can't have, it's almost like one doesn't happen in this realm without the other. So we're, we're seeing one side of the equation of what's, what's being presented now. I'm guessing the other side is going on just without fanfare and anyone knowing it's happening. So, so in the article, it even talked about originally two ships were supposed to take off from Plymouth to here and one was called the Speedwell and it ended up not working out and they didn't go. So my question would be, is that a lie? Did it really come and where did it go, right? And then the other thing is what year did the ship go to Jamestown? Uh, 1607. 1607, so maybe we should go back and look and see if there was any voyage made in 2007 that wasn't paid a lot of attention to that we missed, that we missed right? <clears throat> that something like 2007 or in the same sort of time period. So maybe a little uh, digging into recent voyages. And then the other thing I just wanted to show you, Michael, just to show how sometimes this works, I looked up to see if I could find what a Clovis was, right? And, and Clovis is a city, the only, is, is a city here in California. It's near Fresno. I had a gymnastics meet there when I was a kid and I knew someone who was from Clovis, but I went to see if I could find a Clovis flower and I couldn't, there doesn't seem to be a Clovis flower, but what there does seem to be is a flower shop called Clovis floral that uses a lily for its emblem. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right? So, you know, like, you know, we just, the, the code is late. Sometimes we find the code in history, like as per what, what you know, what Howdy is talking about. And sometimes it comes in the ads on the side of the article or in another interpretation of that which you are looking for and whatnot. So I think we've uh, displayed all of this nicely today in our, in, our, in our own unique individual ways and then synergistically. This was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Are we wrapping this up right about now? I don't have anything else to say. I really don't either. I don't think. I think we've. I think maybe we've presented a really good thing for people to contemplate. 
All right. Because we, because we each had no conclusion. We were just, we had some ideas that we were going to throw off each other and see what happened, right? I think that the conclusion is that this voyage represents both something different than what it says it does, but also much, much more, that there's many interpretations of it. And the story we're being fed is what they want the public to believe, but the people who are trained in the, whatever decoding that this stuff is set up in are perceiving, they're, they're unfolding completely different information. And I think that between the three of us here today, we probably unfolded some of what the message that is sent to them is, right? And it's just a matter, like, you know, what part of what we like to do is start noticing the similarities between the cases which we do this in. And when we start to see what the similarities are, then you can kind of figure out the code from th that they're working from, right? And, and then we can decide what to do with that. But um, I think this was a really interesting uh, way to do this and hopefully you guys will wanna do it again. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I the, my final words would be this is like, yeah, I agree with I agree with you, Emily, like we did have a conclusion. And it's like, this seems to be th this thing, this like, and what, what's interesting is the story came out on the Daily Mail a week before they posted it on Drudge Report, there was a lag, like that doesn't make any sense if you think about it. But anyway, it was. And this seemingly like, you know, background story seems to point out a very, very ancient story and they want, and I love how his point is like, you know, being very aware of like what other journeys are happening. And, and so I think that is significant, but I would say even more so, I think two other things were occurred, which are worthy of, of, of mentioning is like literally the process of what unfolded like the, this dance that the three of us I did together like this random generation for a, a piece of information and then to go talk about it without any sort of pretense and like where it went and like that as an act of of at the very least creation at the very most magic and for like probably the most realistic those are, it's one and the same so i think i think that is worthy of being pointed out but then the other thing is um as you and i have talked a lot about in the glass bead game emily is this this ability to kind of like be flexible with thought with connections and seeing the interconnectedness within the entire system uh not just us but for all the other people who are watching this it is further and further enhancing consciousness to become more aware of the connectedness within reality and less and less uh focused upon like how everything is disconnected so i, I would say like this this thing which we did, and I hope that we do it again, like I'm going to suggest that maybe we do this once a month or something. And uh, you, there's there's multiple levels of benefit besides just the, you know, the, the stuff we're talking about. Absolutely. All right. Howdy, do you have any uh, final words before we go? Not really, other than uh, it was uh, when kind of this idea came to me when we were thinking about doing something together, it was this idea rather than, yeah, having a, uh, let's have a specific topic and we're going to, you know, it was kind of, let's kind of just allow the universe to find out what we want to talk about. Uh, as uh, just, just out of curiosity, just as a, as a little, almost like a science experiment. And so, and then when Michael came, came sent over the, the uh, page a few days ago, Okay, Mayflower AI, 400 years, 1620. Interesting. I, I, I wonder, I was curious, where would this go? What are we going to wind up talking about uh, uh, from this story? And, you know, I knew we would talk for an hour and a half or two hours. Would we actually fill two hours on this? Or is this going to be like 15 minutes and then we veer off to something else, something? We stuck to an hour and 45 minutes just on this topic, pretty much. And that's really interesting to me to see how that something at random showed up like that and how we were able to generate what actually turns out to be really interesting research, either a little bit before this or on the fly as it was going on. So it was just, it was interesting to see what developed from something seemingly so random. <laughs> all right well i think then we're all in agreement that this was a worthwhile exercise and we'll be doing it again so yeah. we hope all of you guys enjoyed it all of our um uh all of our contact information and where you can find each of us and you know 
watch our material or support us will be in the description below so people can check that out there and um all right we'll come back and do this again next month you got it all right guys we'll see you next time take care